dawn, February the 26th, 1991. Tank crews of the U.S. Armored Divisions lie in wait in the desert of southern Iran. In just two days, in one of the most spectacular tank battles of recent history, they would face the heavy armor of Saddam Hussein's crack Republican Guard. My gunner shot his first round at 2,900 meters, popped the turret off a tank, and went up an explosion, and I'm going, yeah, this is neat stuff. I wasn't scared at all or threatened by any other vehicle. On the One tank spearheads the assault against the battle-hardened Soviet-made tanks of the Iraqi army. You knew you had impact if you got that flash. And then typically, a second or two later, you would see flames shooting up. But this tank is wholly untested on the battlefield and shrouded in controversy. The moment of truth has arrived. Using unique archive film and reenactments, Battle Stations penetrates the world of the most high-tech tank in history. The M1 Abrams Super Tank. Battle Tank was a concept that would revolutionize warfare. It was first developed to break the stalemate in the trenches of the First World War. But during World War II, the tank came of age. Fast-moving panzers led the Nazis' stunning blitzkrieg victories of 1940. In 1941, more than 3,500 German panzers led the Nazi invasion of Soviet Russia. The Russian T-34, the standard battle tank of the Soviet army, was produced in tens of thousands in Tankograd, a huge new specialized production center hidden deep in Siberia. These superb machines were a match for almost anything the Germans had until the last stages of the war. They led the Russian advance from Kursk to Berlin. When the United States mobilized for war, Chrysler built a giant tank arsenal in Detroit. Soon, tens of thousands of M4 Sherman tanks began pouring off the production line. The Sherman became the universal allied tank of the war, leading the breakout from Normandy and the final onslaught against Nazi Germany. first sight of a Sherman, there it was, a huge tank, a veritable Rolls Royce compared with what we'd been used to. We knew we had the arsenal of democracy. The pride was that uh, Americans could do it, we could manufacture these tanks. And we were told they were good tanks and they would help us win the war. In late 1944, the German high command believed that superior weapons were the key to victory. So German industry concentrated on producing heavier and heavier tanks, putting their faith in the Tiger and the King Tiger. These tanks were much feared by the Allies, but there were too few of them to turn the tide of war. Tank production has always relied on a compromise between armor, firepower, and mobility. The heavier the armor, the better the protection, but the slower the speed. The bigger the gun, the heavier the casing needed to carry it. Victory or defeat depended on a balance between these characteristics. During the Cold War, the Soviets were years ahead of the West in the development of tank technology. They had produced a range of low-profile designs that were harder to identify and hit for use by the nations of the Warsaw Pact. The US and West Germany, now allies, set to work to produce a new tank of the century that would incorporate the latest scientific developments. But by 1969, after more than $400 million had been spent, the project was way over budget. Congress pulled the plug. But the American quest to design a new generation of battle tanks continued. And in 1972, both Chrysler and General Motors were asked to come up with ideas for a new design. 
United States hadn't had a new tank for quite a number of years, and the Army felt the need to incorporate the knowledge that was available then uh, into a new tank that would give them better firepower, more mobility, and reliability. The Army did, I think, a very intelligent, very smart job of managing the program. The first thing they did was to get a group of seasoned, experienced tankers together at Fort Knox and ask these gentlemen, what is it you'd like to have in the next generation tank? It's somewhat similar to putting a kid in a candy store. And what came out of that was a very tough and demanding set of requirements. World events would also play an important role in shaping the design. In October 1973, the Middle East War saw the largest tank versus tank battle since World War II. Israeli armored brigades fought with British Centurion tanks and the latest American patterns. The Egyptians and Syrian forces were armed with the modern Soviet T-62 tank. The conflict provided the US designers with a unique opportunity. They closely tracked the strengths and weaknesses of the armored divisions and turned the results around on the design team. But the most important lesson learned from the 1973 Middle East War was that the tank remained the dominant weapon on the modern battlefield. The US Army was more committed than ever to design a new main battle tank. Another factor which had a profound effect on the overall design was the new top secret British Chobham armor, codenamed Burlington by the US Army. In 1978, Successful impact tests on the secret Burlington armor were held at the U.S. Army's Aberdeen Proving Ground. There are two basic kinds of tank ammunition. One is kinetic energy. Brute force pushes a hole through the armor, and it's uh, very effective. The other type of uh, anti-tank round is called a chemical energy round. Molten metal comes out of the front of the shell in a finger-sized jet that will burn a hole through several feet of steel. Now, how can we defeat both? Well, the chopper bomber did that. On the 12th of November, 1976, Chrysler was declared winner of the new contract. They had beaten General Motors by redesigning the turret to reduce costs and incorporating a revolutionary gas turbine engine. It was the beginning of a new era in tank design. I recall very well the uh, announcement that we had won, and uh, I stepped on top of a drafting table, and uh, I can still feel the uh, resounding applause, knowing that the Army had chosen our group to proceed with it, and it was just a a moment of elation that was hard to, uh, to capture in word. But the real winner was the U.S. Army. In two years, they made a sensational leap forward in tank technology. In 1978, the first of this new generation of tanks rolled off the production line for evaluation. The M1 Abrams Super Tank was born. It was quite an impressive vehicle. You compared it against the you know, M60, which was our top of the line at the time. It's lower, it's more angular, its design looks more menacing. Its armor is not just all steel. It's designed to defeat a wider range of, of munitions. And its fire control system, though similar to the M60, was in fact superior. So especially when you couple it with a jet engine that's 1,500 horsepower, this, this beast moved faster, more quickly, was more survivable, and was at least as lethal as its predecessor. In 1980, this new model finally went into service as the M1 Abrams. With the birth of this terrifying fighting machine, the battlefield would never be the same again. In 1980, the new M1 Abrams super tank entered military service. But these early days were troubled and controversial. This was the world's top high-tech war machine, but many doubted its combat survivability. 
In the late 1980s, post-Vietnam, the morale of US forces was at an all-time low. The new M1 battle tank became a prime symbol of the Reagan defense buildup. It was also an easy target for those opposed to an increase in defense spending. This was the era of Cold War games, and in a world of electronic warfare, this new generation of battle tank required a completely different approach to crew training. As part of the rebirth of the US armored forces, a radical new national training center was established, op for opposing forces, real-life war games against American soldiers role-playing as Soviet forces. William Heidner took part in these exercises. You could buy a set of, of Soviet tanks uh, to include a complete training package on how to use those tanks. And of course, when their trainer showed up to teach country X how to use these, these new tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, they were taught the Soviet methodology. If we were to go to war somewhere besides the central plains of Europe against the Warsaw Pact, you're still likely to run into the same types of equipment and the same types of tactics. We were known as Krasnovians uh, from the, the fictional town of, or fictional country of Krasnovia. We had a solid OD green uniform. We would wear a Russian style rank insignia and a, a Russian style uh, epaulet and, and branch insignia on our collars. The aim was to replicate combat as close as possible without spilling blood. To operate effectively as a team, modern tank crews require a highly technical skill base with a mental agility to interchange roles if necessary when under fire in combat. The training had to be improved because you know how you have a faster tank, it, it, it traverses faster, it shoots faster. Uh, you have a knee switch, you have your elevation uncoupled, the training had to be more intense. The gunner skills necessary, taking a proper rip the sight, sight picture. All these things had to be done in order to master that tank because it was fast. We were, uh, we were like a family. Your tank crew is your family. You're going through the same thing. You're experiencing everything the next guy is. You know, it's not like, hey, he's got a Mercedes and I got a Pinto or something, you know. It's just, you're all quite equal, regardless of the rank. The Abrams has a crew of four. The commander sits above and behind the gunner in the main turret compartment, with the loader to their left. The driver sits alone in the front of the tank. The driver now had to focus on driving with the buttoned up and, and getting used to the speed because a lot of drivers during nighttime engagements or during the night uh, would run so fast down a course road that they would lose track of where they were. You had to practice with him the, the proper platform in order for him to maintain a stable platform to allow the crew to shoot well and then also keep us on the course road. The loader had to be skilled in his position. He had to be able to pop that door open after the round was fired, pull around, load it, get it armed. So we're looking for three seconds, three to four, that's what we wanted. After you fired a few rounds and you've got the, the caps rolling around on the floor, um, add to that machine gun brass that's lying around, and uh, I could feel the heat coming up through both the, the rubber chemical boots and into my uh, regular boots, So, uh, which was nice, actually, in the wintertime because it was cold. The commander has six periscopes, which provide 360-degree all-round vision. The thing with, uh, with the periscopes is certainly you can uh, navigate and fight down. But you just, you still don't get all of the, the panorama, if you will, of being out and looking left and right to your tanks. But in addition, they have a, what they call a commander's independent viewer, where you have your own thermal device that you can swing left or right. And it's made it easier to be down inside the tank as opposed to outside. Still, old guys like me prefer being up out where we can look around. The Abrams can provide extraordinarily accurate fire at the enemy. The gunner is able to use a thermal imaging system along with a laser rangefinder. But the designers decided not to incorporate an auto-loading system. If you put a, an auto-loader in there with some hundred plus parts, how can that be as reliable as a single individual who's manhandling and loading the ammunition manually.
The new tank had many pioneering features. The greatest fear of any crew member since the very first tank battles was of being burnt alive or of dying from exploding ammunition in a molten coffin. Curious images that were told about previous tanks were, well, you get, you get hit with a heat round. It's gonna burn a hole through there. It's gonna be like a torch. It's gonna send molten armor all over the place and burn you up. Or you're gonna get a kinetic energy round and come flying through your tank and go bouncing around like a ping pong ball, you know, and take half of you out the other side. One of the most innovative features to protect the tank crews were blowout panels. As far as uh, some of the protection that the M1 provided had taken a hit was the fact that uh, you had blow off of panels that had been installed in the turrets and shut heavy thick metal doors so that uh, if hit from the rear or the side of the turret where the ammunition would be ignited, uh, those doors would withstand that blast so that in the event of a fire, the ammo would blow up and not into the crew compartment. The driver has an image intensifier starlight periscope for night vision. This enables the Abrams crews to engage targets rapidly and successfully, despite the darkness of night or daytime battlefield conditions of dust and smoke. Early models of the Abrams weighed in at 60 tons. They were powered by a gas turbine engine and could travel up to 45 miles per hour. The engine was much quieter and easier to maintain, and with no smoke signature, the tank was much harder to detect. The early models had a 105 mm cannon, but in the mid-80s, this was replaced by a much more powerful German-made 120 mm main gun. The Abrams had everything that latest advanced technology could offer to the battle tank. But it still had its critics. It was accused of being a gas guzzler, consuming too much fuel, of being too heavy to transport to a new theater of war, and at $4.3 million apiece, of being far too expensive. During the Cold War, the Abrams was intended as one of the key defensive weapons to protect Europe from a Soviet-led attack by the communist bloc. September 1982 was the Abrams' tactical debut, a turning point in armored warfare. The impressive accuracy of the Abrams' gunnery during the NATO war games in Germany showed its outstanding ability in a world of electronic warfare as a hunter-killer with a lethal weapon. We knew we had a winner across NATO, probably three or four years into service, I would say by the mid-'80s. The tank could be doing 25 or 30 miles an hour over terrain, and you are literally shooting on the move. And when it could demonstrate that capability, that was when I think uh, military professionals certainly realized that this is a fine armored vehicle, and in fact, lives up to its bargain. What we didn't know was exactly how it matched up against its adversary. In the late 1980s, the Cold War was coming to an end, and the tank was still untried and untested in a real field of battle. But all of that was about to change. The Abrams' baptism of fire was in a very different conflict, a war that would reshape US foreign policy, the echoes of which are with us today, the Gulf War. For over 10 years, the Abrams remained untested in the field of battle. There were many critics of its high production costs and questions about the combat survivability of the electronic warfare system. The Abrams was about to enter its trial by fire. From 1980 for nine years, Iraq and Iran fought each other in a long and bloody war. Hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people, lost their lives or were horribly mutilated. Eventually, this brutal struggle came to an end with Iraq's victory in 1988. Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi dictator, had built up a formidable war machine supplied both by the West and by the Soviets. Iraq was left with huge debts. Hussein accused neighboring oil-rich Kuwait of lowering oil prices. On August the 2nd, 1990, 
the Iraqi dictator gave the order for Iraqi forces to invade Kuwait. Saddam Hussein was confident that the West would not respond, but he had badly miscalculated. President Bush Sr. acted quickly and put together a coalition of Western and Arab states committed to the overthrow of Saddam's rule in Kuwait. A vast army began to deploy in the deserts of Arabia. The Iraqi army had a considerable array of tanks, mostly purchased from the former Soviet Union. Among these were a thousand modern Russian T-72s. We certainly didn't underestimate them. We, we thought there was going to be a very formidable enemy. The feeling was that this could be a terrible fight with, with tremendous casualties, and it could go for a very long time. Half a million Americans and other Allied troops began to arrive in Saudi Arabia in an enormous military buildup along the Iraqi border, known as Operation Desert Shield, led by General Norman Schwarzer. After a decade of development and training, yet still untested in battle, the M1 was about to have its baptism of fire. The tank was always planned as an evolutionary design. Now, the latest model, the M1A1, was also urgently deployed to the Gulf. The new version had upgraded computerized gunnery. The stabilized gun mount enabled it to fire reliably whilst traveling at high speed over rough ground. The combination of maneuverability, longer range, and night vision would give the crews the opportunity of defeating any tank in the Iraqi army. There was a precious five months of phony war, acclimatization, upgrading, and training in preparation to take on the Iraqis' Russian T-72s. Dan Miller, captain of Iron Troop, had spent five years on war games where the battlefield plan was to fight on the central plains of Germany. We had trained to fight the Warsaw Pact, so when we we were discovering that we were going to Saudi Arabia, it was surprising. It wasn't so much that we were concerned, of, hey, we, we, we trained to fight these guys, now we're going to go fight the Iraqis. Um, but, hey, at least we're going to get, get in there and get in a fight, because that's soldiers typically want to ride in the sound of the guns. That's typical reactions. Other reaction of my crew and going to the desert was, uh, was a lot of shock and surprise, actually. Some of the guys were a little squirrely about it. They had to constantly talk about, be reassured, you know, that things should be all right. We're going to be, you know, we are trained. Shouldn't be a problem if everybody remembers and falls back on that training. The Iraqis at that time probably thought they had, they certainly had parity and that they could beat us. That they had the numbers and they had good equipment and, and well-trained soldiers and, and they had the, the benefit of being on the defense. It should have been a very formidable fight. And, I, and the Iraqis most likely felt they were well prepared for it, and that they could beat us. Went out into the desert um, and spent the next five months uh, camped on our tanks in the desert waiting. Uh, we were out there uh, you know, through, through the holidays and uh, through Christmas and New Year's and right up into the New Year. Um, we spent a lot of time maneuvering in the desert, um, practicing, especially with me coming out of basic training. I couldn't tell. Uh, tank cannon from a 50 caliber machine gun. I, I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, but spending those five months out in the desert really gave us a chance to hone our skills. The tactics of the, we're going to change the long range gunnery. We knew that. We're shooting across a flat plane. Um, and we were moving in different formations than we ever moved before on a scale of vehicles that had not been done before. On the 16th of January, 1991, the air war against Iraq began. Over succeeding weeks, the high-precision aerial onslaught pummeled Iraq's military infrastructure. But Iraq's huge army, estimated at about one million men, remained undefeated on the ground. Some commanders argued that Iraq could be defeated by the air campaign alone. President Bush Sr. decided on a short, sharp, and decisive ground action, determined to keep casualties to the minimum. 
The commanders now maneuvered men and machines into position. The new and unproven Abrams main battle tank was placed right on the front line. The nature of war and the thoughts of the battle ahead provoked differing emotions. My personal fear was that I would make a bad decision that would get my guys hurt or killed. I was more worried about that than I was about, you know, personal fear of not getting hurt or whatever. You just don't think it's going to happen to me. We were prepared for anything, and I really wasn't too concerned with anything at all when I was on my tank. You know, just being away from it was scary to me. My biggest fear going over there was that I was going to be called on to kill people that, you know, I'd find myself in some village in Iraq somewhere gunning down, you know, children armed with RPGs or something like that. And, and I, I don't think 18, 18 year olds, 19 year olds think about the dangers of themselves. I can't get hurt. But the critics would not be silenced. Many still felt that the Abrams would simply jam up in the sands of the desert. Under Saddam's threat of engaging the coalition in the mother of all battles, the young tank crews led their M1s onto the battle. Five months, the coalition forces had practiced, patrolled, and maneuvered in preparation for battle. Desert Shield was about to turn into Desert Storm. For the Abrams crews, the days of phony war would soon be over. The Iraqi army had been worn down by constant attacks from the coalition airstrikes. Conscripts stuck out in foxholes in the desert front line had little will left to fight. Only the elite Republican Guard was ready and eager to take on the West with a force of 100,000 men and 1,000 tanks. So at 4 a.m. on the 24th of February, 1991, the ground war was launched. Operation Desert Storm. Two U.S. Marine divisions first attacked from the south, quickly penetrating what was known as the Saddam Line. They made rapid progress towards Kuwait City, only slowed down by the sheer numbers of prisoners on the battlefield. Bad weather and smoke from the oil fields, which the Iraqis had set on fire, obscured the desert. And everywhere, bombs and mines were exploding, adding to the confusion. Dan Miller's cavalry troop was tasked with a deadly mission, to ride point, to seek, find, and engage the enemy. American cavalry is armed heavily enough to fight for information. We don't have to employ a standoff, look, develop information, and send the report back. I can make you shoot at me. That tells me where you are, and I can either kill you myself or pop back, report higher, and allow a higher level commander to pass a whole division through to come and kill you. That's the role of American cavalry. That's what we did that. On February the 26th, the first major tank engagement took place. The Battle of 73 Easting began with well dug in units of the Republican Guard. The Abrams tanks of Eagle Troop, 2nd Armored Cavalry, led the assault by using their thermal visioning to identify the Iraqi tanks. For the Abrams, its first shooting war had phenomenal results. It is a busy, busy battlefield. And you just, you don't realize, to me it seemed like it was four or five hours, but it was really probably about an hour and a half engagement from start to finish with about 25 minutes of real serious, intense, two-way range. They're shooting at us, uh, we're shooting at them. They're bringing mortar rounds in on us. Typically, the, the Soviets, when you would put them under artillery, their doctrine was to, to close with you as fast as possible. That's exactly what I did with Iron Troop, which I said, okay, let's advance faster so that we could get in amongst them. So eventually, between our counter battery fire and the fact that we were getting too close for them to, to use it, it took, a, it took another tool out of his box that he could use against my guys. 
23 minutes of combat, nine lone American tanks had taken on and wiped out all 38 Iraqi armored vehicles. They had cut a three-mile swathe of destruction and taken out Iraq's most capable armor. I knew that, it, that the, the M1 was doing well from the first round. We fired at a real target. Um, I shot my first round, and my gunner shot his first round at 2,900 meters, popped the turret off a tank, and went up an explosion. And I'm going, yeah, this is neat stuff. You know, that round really will blow a turret off. In the darkness, the Iraqi gunners fired wildly at muzzle flashes of American tanks on the moon. But burning Iraqi vehicles made the battlefield so bright that Steed's thermals whited out, a temporary blindness which made the tank vulnerable to enemy fire. We could see the damage that had been wreaked. You had burned out hulks, you had turrets flipped over. You had, you had shell, shell shocked Iraqis. Steed was then ordered to stop and round up some Iraqi prisoners ahead of him. The rest of the battalion had driven off. They were gone. And my platoon leader was somewhere behind me, which I had no idea where he was. He stopped and started signaling to the Iraqis trying to surrender. Just then, a burning Iraqi hulk silhouetted his tank. Hidden just a thousand meters away on the burning battlefield, a lone T-72 crew sighted the illuminated Abrams, an unbelievable target. The T-72 had a perfect sight on the most vulnerable part of the Abrams, the side of the gun turret. The enemy's autoloader swung into action with a deadly 125 millimeter heat round. Almost surreal. It was kind of dreamlike in a way. I'm sitting there looking in my front, watching, keeping an eye on the prisoners, keeping an eye on vehicles of my right and left. The round came in the left side of the, the tank. My loader had got hit in the legs, and he crawled over the side. By the time Steed had regained consciousness, the fire extinguishers had worked, but the tank was still an easy target and in danger of exploding. Steed's first concern was for his gunner. My gunner was trying to come up in front of me because the black smoke was pouring out of the vehicle. And I, I was trying to get him under control so that we could get up on top and see what's wrong. So I reached down in there to get him. I turned around and noticed my blast doors were open. I was concerned about ammunition being cooked off. Um, so I tried to push it shut. I was able to close the door, get it re-secured, got him out. Um, I had a long spaghetti cord, so I could, I could still talk on the radio, so I was talking to my commander, explaining to him that we'd been hit, and giving him a status on my people. And then I went back to the tank trying to get it started, because we needed to ride out of there. All the warning lights, everything was lit up. It, it would turn over, but it wouldn't drink. So at that point, uh, we started trying to figure out how are we gonna get out of here. Steed and his injured crew were in serious danger. After almost an hour hiding from the enemy at the rear of the tank, one of Steed's platoon sighted the stricken Abrams and came to their aid. I was kind of pissed. You know, I was pissed I was in a position that caused this to begin with. And uh, it was fair to say that I wanted to continue to do more to keep that from happening to somebody else. Having secured the safety of his wounded crew, Steed then insisted on taking command of the tank and return to the battle. For his heroic action, Tony Steed was later awarded the Bronze Star for Valor. It's been obvious since tank warfare began to me, but. You don't stop a rolling tank in the middle of a battle area. We're not POW wagons. So that changed the SOP real quick, like not within the platoon, within the unit, within the battalion, the orders were issued. Um, so that, that wouldn't happen again. At dawn on the following morning, it seemed that the Iraqi army was beginning to withdraw to the north, towards Basra. But the tanks of the Republican Guard had dug in behind a six-mile ridge of high ground to fire on the U.S. forces 
and allow the rest of the army to escape to the north. The Abrams would now be facing its toughest opposition yet. In the largest armored conflict since World War II, it was about to play a major role in one of the greatest tank battles of the 20th century. The Battle of Medina Ridge. The largest single tank engagement of the whirlwind war of Desert Storm took place on the fourth day of fighting at Medina Ridge on the 27th of February, 1991. One Abrams tanks of the US 1st and 3rd Armored Divisions now engaged with over 300 T-72 tanks of the battle-hardened Republican Guard. Despite smoke and sand, the thermal sites could identify the Iraqi T-72 tanks long before they could be seen themselves. Even where they had been hastily dug in behind several feet of sand, the Iraqi tanks could be picked up. Incredibly, the Abrams was able to hit the T-72s at 3,500 yards, well before it was visible through the optical sights of the Soviet-made tanks. The Abrams often beat the Iraqis to the first shot, and when this was a depleted uranium round, it could destroy a T-72 with a single shell. The Iraqi tanks exploded in a sheet of flame. The Iraqi tank crews tried firing back at the American tanks when they could see them, but they were out of range. After five months of waiting in the desert, loader Sheehan Miles was prepping his tank when he was ordered into action. We were supposed to cross the border at midnight, and uh, as I was prepping the tank and getting everything ready around 11 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, my platoon leader comes running back across the, uh, the uh, assembly area, yelling, everybody get ready, we're leaving now. And uh, on five minutes notice, we loaded everything up in the tank as quick as we could and got in and, and moved out. So when it came time to fire it in combat, of course, the, the ammo door was clogged with sand and I couldn't open it. And the breach was filled with sand and the main gun wouldn't fire. And meanwhile, you know, we're, people are shooting at us and nothing was working. And after I hit the circuit breaker, you know, I'm halfway back into my position when uh, uh, the gunner fired and it went off that time and practically knocked me out of my seat. Under cover of darkness, the Abrams superior gunnery range and night weapon systems were decisive. At Medina Ridge, when we first came into contact, uh, the Red Platoon had actually identified the targets, and uh, we were then given the OK to engage, and we were told at that time that there, were, there was nothing in front of us but enemy. So we pulled up online and started engaging targets. Our weapon systems can reach out and touch at a distance, and uh, our sights are much better than the Soviet-made tanks, and I, I wasn't scared at all or threatened by any other vehicle on the battlefield. I was just so intrigued, you know? I was looking around, this is the first time I've ever been away from home. I was actually in combat. I felt so distant. During the Battle of Medina Ridge, the Abrams gun had proved superior to that of the T-72. With their own tanks being shot up like in a turkey shoot, the Iraqi resolve to fight in such an uneven battle was now beginning to fade. By the end of the battle, only four tanks had taken direct hits, but due to the durability of the Abrams armor, all the crews survived. Although tank warfare was long-range and impersonal for the majority of the Abrams crews, loader Gene Benson had a rare face-to-face -face encounter with an Iraqi soldier of the Republican Guard. He was wounded, so as we're coming up to him, I got my 240 on him, and, you know, for if, if he had a weapon or anything like that, I would be ready. And I was already locked and loaded and, and ready to go. But he had his hand up and he was waving, like, help me. I almost grabbed my camera and took a picture of him, you know, as, as opposed to shooting him. But then I said, hey, no, you know, we were told this is degrading. And I said, okay, well, we'll just pass by. Close encounters with the horror of war.
would have a profound effect on the 18-year-old loader she and Mild. We did have one incident where uh, some trucks came rushing through our position in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, we, we did what you do when unknown trucks come rushing towards your position in the middle of the night. We, we shot them, and one of them was a fuel truck, and it caught the other truck on fire, and that was full of people. And they all came out running, and they were on fire, and we machine gunned them and uh, um, killed them all. You know, again, that was tough to live with um, for a long time. I was angry because the, the, the way we prosecuted that particular mission, you know, sending a tank company down this crowded road that was already covered in burning and destroyed equipment, the helicopters had fired up, just didn't make any sense to me. But, uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't an officer, and I'm not the kind of person who makes those calls. The destructive power of the battalions of tanks was overwhelming. In just over two hours, 186 Iraqi tanks and 127 armored vehicles, the cream of Saddam's forces, were destroyed. The battle was a turning point. The Iraqi army was routed and in full-scale retreat towards Basra. President Bush Sr., needing to keep his coalition together, declared a ceasefire at midnight on February the 28th. After a hundred hours of the ground war, General Schwarzkopf and the coalition forces had won a stunning victory. Kuwait was now free. After the war, it was estimated that the Iraqis had lost 3,700 tanks and over 20,000 men killed, with tens of thousands wounded. Only 18 Abrams have been disabled and just four knocked out by Iraqi anti-tank fire. Not a single member of a tank crew had been killed in action. The combination of the super tank's advanced technology and the superior training and discipline of the crews had won the day. The T-72 is actually a very good, very dangerous tank. So if you took an Iraqi tank crew and put them in an M1, American tank crew in a T-72, when you trained them to their standards and trained us to our standard in a T-72, we'd have won that war with those machines. You have all the technology in the world, but if you can't use it properly, you're no better than somebody, you know, throwing a rock. What they put out in sweat and in fake blood at the National Training Center reaped great dividends in, in the real war. Probably one of the hardest moments after the end of the war we went and picked up our tanks. All of a sudden, to have it be this just this impersonal thing over there in the world, it felt like losing a friend. Uh, we all know that the M1 strengths are its armor, its uh, maneuverability. Uh, you can fire offensively or defensively. It was just awesome. The revolutionary advances of the M1 Abrams had taken tank design to a new level. Tanks were now part of a new kind of warfare, where if you could locate the enemy, you could hit him, and probably destroy him. The Abrams had earned its place in this new era of electronic, computerized war. After all that happened, I would say that the Abrams of survivability A, A number one. It kept my crew from getting killed. 